Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your location. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's webinar. We're very happy to have you here and, uh, you know, particularly during these uh, difficult and, and challenging and unusual times for everybody across the board, um, really appreciate you taking the time out to, to join us today. Um, we have about an hour long presentation of uh, a different series of, of speakers, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, we, we see a few more people are, are still trickling in. <clears throat> uh, so we're just going to pause for one second here and uh, just make sure everybody can join. Okay, we see the numbers continuing to go up, which is great, <clears throat> but I think in the interest of time, because we do have quite a bit to get through, uh, we'll, we'll get going. Uh, so um, this, this webinar is, is titled Widening Deforestation Free Commitments and Capital Flows for Progress in Producer Countries. It is being hosted in collaboration between uh, Forest Trends and our Supply Change Initiative, as well as UNEP, uh, UN Environment Program and the Finance Initiative. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so the um, the format here, just a little bit of housekeeping, is that we have one hour. Um, we might um, have additional time at the end, but we're, we're going to keep to one hour. And if we do have these presentations and an opportunity for Q&A, uh, please send in your questions to the uh, Q&A box. You can also chat that to us, to the organizers, and we'll, we'll collate everything and, and have that ready at the end. If we do not get through every question, um, we'll, we'll do our best to follow up with anybody who's presented those questions throughout. Um, there are two options for joining the audio. The first is a uh, microphone over the computer's VOIP, uh, but also you can dial in by telephone uh, in case that doesn't work for you. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later. Uh, an email will be sent after the webinar uh, to you and, and all other registrants as well as our, our full our distribution network. Um, but, but please note that you are muted on entry and, um, and we'll continue to move forward. Uh, so next slide. So here's the overview of our, our speakers. I'm, my name is Stephen D'Onofrio. I'm the Director of Ecosystem Marketplace and Supply Chain Initiatives here at Forest Trends. Uh, based out of New York City, we have uh, four speakers. Um, the first is going to be Philip Rothrock, who is the Program Manager for Supply Chains here at Forest Trends. Uh, Philip will be doing a deep dive into recent analysis that has been completed and a report that has just been published uh, in collaboration with the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative, uh, which is covering uh, companies and commitments related to Palm and in Indonesia. Uh, Owen Hawk will, will follow up. He's the he's an economist of uh, commodity and supply chains at WWF US. Uh, Owen will be talking about uh, their their latest sustainable palm oil uh, scorecard, as well as uh, discussing particulars related to sustainable palm sourcing more broadly. Uh, that will be followed by Julie Nash, Dr. Julie Nash, who is with Spiries, and she'll be talking about how. Uh, how they work on aligning uh, deforestation free commitments uh, to capital flows in, in the investment community. And then our closing presentation will be from Lara Jakob. Uh, she's with the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative and also the Good Growth Partnership, which is a, a collaboration. Uh, and she'll be talking about the importance of data for banks and, and how financial institutions and companies can work together for forest as commodity uh, sourcing decisions. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll just provide a, a brief introduction and overview uh, before getting into these, these presentations. Um, just the, the, the short and simple is that Forest Trends has been around uh, just about 20 years and we've uh, just had our anniversary in the past year, but supply chains actually started in 2013 uh, with uh, the initial round of research beginning in 2014 and our, our, our soft launch into um, in the start of 2015. We have, have worked over the years to do company research, which is uh, mostly desk-based. We do have a number of collaborators. Uh, one of the data sources in is CDP, but we go to a number of other uh, um, public sources of information that companies provide uh, to compile a directory, which is now the largest database of companies um, that are developing commitments and implementing policies and goals for driving uh, deforestation out of their commodity supply chains as well as their production. 
the four commodities you see on the left are the ones that we started with. We recently added in cocoa, uh, but these are the main drivers of deforestation. And that cocoa build out, that expansion uh, has happened uh, with, with um, in partnership with Ceres with funding coming from NORAD. Uh, the four commodities you see to the left, uh, we've, we've done a number of reports over the years focusing on uh, broad level uh, understanding of what companies and commitments mean, uh, but also then uh, more recently been, been trying to tackle a very targeted uh, focus areas, uh, such as uh, traceability specifically, talking about um, particular commodities and, and countries, and, and that's something we'll get into more uh, today. Uh, next slide, please. The, um, the work, as I mentioned, has been happening over several years. Uh, this is just briefly to show you some of the growth in, in our companies that we've researched. Um, just a couple of things that we try to point out um, is that not every company that we research does have a commitment, uh, but those that do on that second line, they then uh, are given a public profile on our website. Uh, the information is available freely and, and we do have a, a bounty of information that sits behind that as well. Uh, and that's what we're able to dive into to produce uh, you know, the content that we'll be talking about here today. Um, we also uh, focus on companies uh, that don't have commitments as well. Um, and actually the, um, the number here that, that you're seeing, uh, I think it's been cut off, but the, uh, the, the number of companies is, is roughly around 250 that don't have commitments at this point. Um, and, and that's you know, a real interesting balance because as we continue to do this research, we do uncover that companies that don't have commitments previously uh, do end up having commitments um, in later years and, and others that may have had a commitment do drop off. And so we keep track of that as we go through. Um, next slide, please. The context of this webinar is really to talk about how when, you're, when we're doing this type of data collection and research that we're able to uh, look at sort of the global landscape and, and really uh, try to understand when you're um, a company, a manufacturer, a retailer, and sourcing supply from across the globe, um, how this information can be decision useful for not just companies and investors and governments in those uh, consuming company, countries, uh, but it's also very relevant information for uh, those, those same actors and other agencies working in those producer countries. Um, so we, um, the focus of this webinar may take a bit more of a lean around Indonesia and palm oil because we're, we're talking about it in the context of this report that we're launching, which, is, um, uh, which, which Philip will be talking about in more detail. Um, but the reason why uh, I wanted to share a bit about Indonesia and palm oil is because um, this is this is what drives uh, the work that we do to help us uncover how do we really drive system change or systemic change between companies and and the sourcing of their commit of their commodities. Uh, so Indonesia is the third highest uh, primary tropical forest uh, loss country in the world, and that's in in 2018. Uh, data that we found that this is coming from WRI and, and Global Forest Watch um, sourcing information. Um, that rate of loss has declined in recent years, uh, which may be in part due to strengthening government, the work of companies and addressing commodity driven deforestation, investors and other, other reasons as well. Um, however, the clearance of, of oil, uh, the clearance of forests for oil palm uh, plantations has been the leading driver uh, since the you know, 2000. Um, they, the result of that has, has led Indonesia to becoming the world's largest producer of palm oil, uh, which is uh, roughly you know, equaling about 16 million jobs. Uh, so that is not insignificant in terms of economic productivity. Uh, and, but, but the challenge is that despite political interest, you know, potentially in some, some countries, there's been little demand for sustainable palm oil to, to really uh, help move the needle. Uh, large companies uh, in Indonesia control 50% of the oil palm uh, concessions and smallholders control 40%, which is expected to grow uh, another 20% by 2030. Uh, next slide. And in this context, what we are looking in, uh, and, and into the data for and starting to uncover it, that there is good news. There's always good information uh, and mixed in with, with the challenges, and that's what supports our work. Uh, so the, the, the driver here is that uh, the report you see off to the right there is, is really talking about you know, corporate ambition and, 
and that there is a growing number of companies with commitments uh, to address the, the physical and, and you know other types of risk, reputational, financial risks. And then the, the good thing also is that export markets are starting to change their demand uh, for sustainable palm oil, uh, for certified sustainable palm oil, where India, that's growing, but it's, it is still nascent. Uh, the EU, almost 75% of the palm oil imported to Europe is uh, sustainable palm oil. And uh, in China, there's been steady demand, but there's um, more competition uh, with other oils. Uh, so, so also very little uh, sustainable palm oil demand. And then on the other side of it, which is relevant to our speakers here, is that there is increasing investor pressure. And, and that's what Julie and Laura will talk about later on. Um, it's, it, there's a number of institutions that are really leading the charge, engaging uh, from sort of the collaborative effort, uh, and that's some of the work that Ceres and UNFFI do, uh, but also the financial institutions themselves are getting involved in changing their decisions, changing lending practices and other things. Um, so I, I just wanted to provide that, that high level context uh, to introduce you know, what we're here for today and uh, really excited to, to be able to hand over the, the microphone to Philip, uh, who will be our first speaker. And, and then also I'll be moderating throughout and uh, at the end uh, also moderating the Q&A. Uh, so thank you again for joining and uh, over to you, Philip. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I just wanted to start and say that I uh, manage our supply chain team research. And as Stephen mentioned, today I'll be talking to you about sustainability leadership within Indonesian palm oil supply chains. And before I go forward, I just wanted to say, um, take a moment to thank um, our colleagues at UNEP FI, as well as uh, Laura Weather, Kate Ellis, and Ciro Calderon from our team for their hard work on research and report and making this webinar possible. Uh, so please, uh, next slide. So to kick it off, um, supply chain recently rolled out a large new suite of in-depth metrics. And so we teamed up with UNFFI to select a subset of companies in which we can pilot the review of these new metrics. Um, and so companies were selected because they disclosed more in uh, more certain in-depth metrics um, than other companies in the uh, in our supply chain tracking. And these were all companies that uh, buy or, or grow or supply um, palm oil from Indonesia. There was, among these companies, there was roughly an even split um, between publicly held or privately held and publicly traded companies, um, representing more than 10 sectors, with half of them manufacturing food products and consumer staples with palm oil ingredients, while the next largest groups um, either farmed the, uh, the oil palms or retailed the products with palm oil in them. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we captured a wide variety of firms operating within multiple supply chain levels, and this is fairly representative of our whole sample, of our whole database. Next slide, please. So these companies uh, were chosen, you know, to, were chosen because they were, um, they had disclosed a lot more information around implementation metrics. So as a consequence, you can see the majority of them uh, 99 of them have have commitments and a lot of them 88 have progress and so this is this is something to keep in bear in mind when we're looking at our, our results and so what we found is that there's a much higher level of annual progress reporting for palm than say for other commodities that we've looked at next slide please and so as you can see here out of the 99 companies with commitments most are relying on some form of roundtable on sustainable palm oil, RSPO for short, certification supply chain model. So that's, um, you can see the segregated are better, mass balance are better, or um, some sort of uh, book and claim version. Um, and so the most popular being the mass balance uh, model, which involves mixing supplies from certified and non-certified operations in contrast with segregated supply chains, which physically certify, uh, physically separate all certified supplies. So currently, all the all the companies can prove compliance by relying on the RSPO accredited third-party auditors to certify their adherence 
to their product uh, for their production areas and chain of custody to the RSPO standards. However, as you might imagine, companies may want further verification of compliance with forest protections, particularly the um, particularly those not relying on RSPO certification. So, supply chain found that only 17 companies reported using satellite monitoring as a means of verifying compliance. Um, many uh, many others may or may not be using it, but that's what we found. And we suspect that, uh, that media attention, investor pressure, and uh, larger budgets for sustainability can help explain why some of these uh, big, big name uh, palm oil users are rely on satellite monitoring. Next slide, please. So the ability of companies to verify production location of 100% of their palm oil is critical for buyers to be able to verify supplier compliance against deforestation-free commitments. So in setting, implementing, and monitoring their commitments, companies can turn to tools like the Accountability Framework Initiative, or AFI for short, which provides guidelines for implementing their commitments. Uh, this includes several options listed above for ensuring commitment compliance. Full traceability, though, can be really difficult to achieve, especially for companies that are downstream in supply chains, such as retailers and manufacturers, which have large and complex supply chains. So in lieu of achieving full traceability, many companies use other strategies to minimize risk in sourcing. And this includes the use of certification systems like RSPO segregated or identity preserved models, which you can see um, listed in the, um, the uh, first bar. bar. Um, however, what we do find is that there are other options that companies can take that may or may not be adhered to the AFI. However, these can be problematic for companies because they may increasingly receive requests from public pressure, uh, from public disclosure of progress so that buyers, campaign groups, investment, and or you know, investor coalitions, and even banks can verify their commitment progress. And so if that information is pu isn't publicly available, that can be problematic for uh, these companies. So next slide. So supply chain recognizes that investors looking to manage forest risk within their portfolios will likely want to know how much forested areas could un be under threat and where. So for this study, supply chain analyzed information from 42 producers. We quantified the, the size of the total certified and protected areas reported by the companies. Knowing the location and the size of the areas under protection and specifically to high conservation value areas can be increasingly important for downstream buyers of palm oil and their investors because it can help them better understand forest risk and help them visualize land use changes over time. Supply chain now tracks the format in which companies disclose this sourcing information, whether it's through maps, coordinates, or other some less specific uh, uh, means of uh, communicating that information. Uh, and so that, and there's exciting news now that the RSPO will now make public um, maps of their member concessions, um, and this um, th and this could make the um, this could improve standard risk analyses, um, which will uh, for financial in uh, institutions whether they're members of the RSPO or not. And th this is really important because um, being able to determine where and uh, and the size of these. Uh, concessions can be really important for those risk analyses. Next slide, please. So when conducting a risk assessment and or engaging with companies within financial portfolios, investors may want to carefully examine which standards producers claim to adhere to. Because standards vary widely um, between what's required, because standards vary um, widely under what's uh, required under law, the RSPO, and the AFI. So our, our analysis found considerable variation 
in requirements around, say, for example, protecting high conservation value areas, addressing non-compliance, and uh, administration of mechanisms for handling grievances related to issues in and around the areas of production. So for this report, we break down how producers and buyers in, in general address these topics um, in comparison to the legal standards, those advocated by AFI and those under the RSPO. Um, one surprising finding that we found was that no companies appeared to explicitly have policies against sourcing from protected areas. We suspect this is because companies often rely on RSPO certification requirements to implicitly indicate that they're addressing this risk. But this is something, as you'll hear about from, uh, from Lara, that banks are, are um, on the hook for addressing. So next slide, please. So to wrap it up, um, smallholders play a critical role within supply chains, um, and they control roughly 40% of production, and that's expected to grow by 60% um, in 2030. So when assessing corporate risk, financial institutions and banks will definitely need to consider if and how companies are supporting uh, smallholder farmers who are often impoverished and do not have the means to comply with their commitments. So um, we also took a look at smallholder support, and this is something where we found 45 companies aspired to help smallholders, yet only 30, or roughly two-thirds, actually noted that they were falling through with the support. Um, this, um, the good news is this type of leadership can come from many places in the supply chain. So half of those providing support were producer companies that are operating in Southeast Asia, but some uh, you know, some others were in North American and Euro European downstream companies that are looking to reach back through their supply chains. So that this is just gives you a sample of kind of the, the work that we put into this um, report. But now I think we want to turn to kind of other, other uh, panelists to kind of discuss the larger implications for these findings and how this can impact uh, financial communities in managing their risks uh, within their portfolios. And now I turn it to Owen with the World Wildlife Fund. Thanks, Philip. So if I could talk briefly about some insights on sustainable palm oil commitments from WF's recent scorecard, um, and also the role of downstream companies in Asia for furthering demand for sustainable palm oil. So next slide, please. So WS most recent scorecard was launched in January, just a couple months ago. Uh, it surveyed 173 companies from the retail, manufacturing, and food service sectors from 14 countries, mostly European countries and US and Canada, but it also included a couple from uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. The scorecard captured 9 million metric tons of palm oil, which is about 12% of global supply to reveal how companies are progressing on their commitments, um, specifically progress in sourcing RSPO certified palm oil. So a, a big takeaway of the scorecard was that we really still need to be seeing continued progress in the uptake of CSPO, even among the more what are considered advanced markets, um, those being in North America and Europe. Uh, so while we have seen sort of steady progress uh, from our past scorecards from 29% of the total volume that we assessed being certified in 2013 uh, to 58% with this scorecard, uh, you know, progress has still been quite slow. Furthermore, many companies have not achieved their 2020 commitments, so just over half of the companies surveyed by the scorecard uh, who had a commitment to be 100% certified, are still certified by 2020, which was 117 companies only half achieve that goal. Um, so many companies are progressing, but still quite a few are off target, even on their own goals. Um, the scorecard also reveals that sourcing of physical RSPO certified palm oil is still not quite the norm. Uh, you can see that at the donut chart there on the right. So 56% of the volume that we captured 
uh, either booking claim or not certified at all. So those volumes represent palm oil that is not um, not physical certified sustainable palm oil that's entering company supply chains. As Phil mentioned, mass balance, which mixes, sorry, back one, thanks. Uh, as Phil mentioned, the mass balance system is the most popular choice, and that's the one which mixes the uncertified and sustainable palm oil. Um, and only 16% of the volume is certified under the highest standard, uh, which is identity preserved or segregated. So while we know certification isn't the only answer to sustainable palm oil, it is an important component. Um, and our scorecard shows, you know, we, we really need to continue incentivizing progress and transitioning to 100% coverage um, of RSPO certified palm oil by these companies and also preferably raising the uptake of segregated and identity preserved palm oil, which gets at all kinds of um, issues in supply chains and costs and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. So among the downstream companies who are active in these supply chains, we know that it's really North American and European companies that are driving the commitments and the action. Um, but I think it's very important not to lose sight of the fact that Asia is the key market uh, in demand for palm oil. So we know about 60% of palm oil consumed in 10 Asian countries, with Indonesia, India, and China accounting for 40% of global demand alone. We also know Asia's middle class is growing quite rapidly. So by 2030, about two-thirds of the world's middle class will be located in Asian countries. So essentially, the demand for consumer products and the palm oil they contain is only going to become larger uh, in the coming years, which raises the prospect that Asia is going to continue to grow as a uh, large leakage market for unsustainable palm oil. So it's key here that banks and investors are leveraged to engage downstream Asian companies, primarily in the consumer goods sector, uh, on sustainable palm oil issues. Some of this work is already starting to occur through uh, PRI's palm oil working group. Um, but there's also still work to be done in raising the capacity of Asian banks and investors um, as they are the main lender to the palm oil industry. So often this starts with just having discussions about the awareness of climate risks, including uh, deforestation risks from agriculture and demonstrating the relevance of this to uh, their business. Um, it can also start with education on ESG issues more generally, which you know, might eventually down the road lead to the adoption of a specific palm oil policy. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Bill. Next presenter, which is the, Dr. Julie Nass, uh, Program Director for Food and Forest over at Ceres. Uh, Julie, over to you. Hello, thank you for asking me to participate in the webinar today. Um, my name is Julie Nash. I'm Program Director of Food and Forest at Ceres. Um, and if we can go to the first slide. Um, so I'm asked many questions, um, not only in webinars like this, but um, from individuals that we interact with within the deforestation community. And one of the things that I'm asked uh, a lot is why are investors acting now? And so, as you can see from the headlines uh, that are here on the screen, um, that there has been a significant uptick in um, investor interest and um, engagement with companies within their portfolio within the last year. And a lot of this is stemming from the fact that many investors, like pension funds, um, take long-term perspective when it comes to um, risks and return. So when they think about this, they recognize the impacts of climate change and that it must be integrated into their long-term investment strategies. Um, investors share the same objectives uh, with companies. They want to be able to see uh, long-term growth. So if you could move to the next slide. So the other question I'm asked a lot of times is what investors are active. So I can talk a little bit about the series investor network. Um, so, as you can see from the slide, um, we have some of the largest public pension funds in North America, and these pension funds are interested in meeting the needs of their current beneficiaries without compromising, compromising the needs of future beneficiaries. 
you can see that we have large asset managers, and those asset managers are seeking ways to integrate ESG risks and opportunities into their investment process. And you can also see that we have many um, leaders in responsible and sustainable investing. So if you can move to the next slide. So what actions are these investors taking? So there are three that I'll highlight and then I'll focus in on how they're engaging with companies. So the first is that investors can collectively signal for some type of policy action. And what this means is investors have a strong voice when it comes to policy issues, and we've seen them using that voice when it comes to climate change and disclosure. Um, we have found that um, they can really influence um, many within the policy discussion. They're also able to leverage their voice as owners and lenders to companies. So you'll hear us talking about companies that are engaged within a portfolio, and they engage with that based on risk. And the third area um, is that investors can both buy and sell um, equity and debt. So they can allocate their investment dollars to drive markets, um, and that really impacts a company's cost of capital. So how much um, it takes to be able to borrow funds, and, um, and a lot of times internal compensation within a company. If you can move to the next slide. So um, I did want to get into more detail when it comes to um, investors engaging with companies. And that's what, I'll be honest, we spend a lot of time within our group um, working on. So just to kind of provide a little background for that, um, investors will look within their portfolio and identify risks that they don't think are very well captured within the market. They'll analyze the portfolio and highlight companies with the most exposure to that risk. And then they'll look at that company to see how that company performs versus known risk mitigation issues. So if we look at this from, um, say, a palm oil perspective, they'll look within their portfolio to the companies that are most exposed either to market risk or reputation risk due to deforestation. Um, and they will compare and they'll look at that company versus its peers to see how they're doing um, in terms of risk mitigation. So we talk about what makes for a good company commitment from an investor standpoint that's really based on how well they're covering their risks. And so a company, an investor will decide to be able to engage with the company through something like letters that would kick off a dialogue where they'll talk with a company sometimes numerous times per year or a shareholder resolution. So that's kind of an overview of the engagement process. What has been interesting in terms of the last few years are the rise of these investor coalitions um, so that it's not a single investor that will engage with the company, but instead they will collectively engage with the company. So one of the initiatives that we have that's a partnership with PRI is the investor initiative on, on sustainable forests. And right now that um, initiative is engaging with over 50 companies um, throughout the world. So not just US-based companies, but, um, but global companies that have exposure um, to risk due to deforestation from beef and soy. Um, and another exciting um, element that we work on is something called the Climate Action 100, um, where Ceres and other partner organizations uh, coordinate investor engagement with some of the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters. So that's an important um, change that we've seen recently. But what I really want to talk about is turning data into action. So we've seen a lot of data um, within this presentation, and the way that um, investors really turn that data into action um, is by looking to understand how a company is engaging on the, on the known risks. So do they have supply chain traceability? Do they have strong cross-commodity no deforestation policies? Do they disclose progress on those deforestation commitments? So we've definitely seen in areas of the presentation that there's in some ways a gap 
where companies have made commitments, <laughs> but um, what is the progress that they're making in those commitments? How are they doing versus their deadlines? And then, of course, um, we um, are very focused on greenhouse gas emissions and land use change since commodity-driven deforestation is such uh, a large driver of change. Um, but I'll stop there, and I don't know, Stephen, if you have any questions or if you can be doing questions throughout, um, but I'd be happy to answer questions the material. Great. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, that's very, very helpful to bring this, um, you know, out of the, the meat and potatoes of the, the, the data into, uh, you know, really how this becomes practical for the investment community. Uh, I think instead of uh, doing any questions now, what we do have you know, some coming in and people that are raising their hands. Well, just continue forward. I think the flow is going well. So, so over uh, to you, Laura, um, as the final speaker, and then we'll, we'll turn to questions. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to keep it brief because I'm quite wary of uh, time and the need for questions uh, and answer. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks as well to Forest Trends for hosting this um, webinar. It's been really great working with them over the last uh, year to develop this report. So I think as, as Stephen and Philip mentioned, this report was produced under the, under the auspices of the uh, Good Growth Partnership. Can we have the next slide, please? The next slide. Uh, yeah, and I'd like to say a few words about uh, what the Good Growth Partnership is about. Next slide. Um, the Good Growth Partnership is a, a Jeff-funded multi-agency program focused on taking deforestation out of commodity supply chains of beef in uh, the Chaco of Paraguay, soy in the Cerrado of Brazil, and palm oil in uh, Indonesia and Liberia. And the idea is to take an integrated approach to solving the issue of deforestation, tropical deforestation, uh, by creating uh, sustainable production models, uh, a market demand for those products. So this is the work that uh, WWF is leading in particular, and a means to finance those new approaches. So this is the work that UNEPFI along with the IFC is uh, leading. Next slide, please. Um, and this particular component under the Good Growth Partnership uh, is focused on a number of uh, different work streams. Um, one is creating uh, an enabling and supporting environment through the alignment of environmental policies and the lending practices of banks in particular. Um, we're also working on capacity building of banks and other financial institutions. Um, we are um, developing new methods and tools for risk management. Um, and this also includes uh, you know, using data and uh, metrics for the uh, for feeding into those tools and methodologies. And finally, um, and I think most importantly, it's uh, taking all of those approaches and realigning capital for sustainable land use through the uh, development of new products and funds and services. Um, next slide, please. So the importance of data and metrics for banks and other financial institutions is uh, really critical. And Julie touched on uh, some of those aspects, whether it's um, you know, demand from the market, uh, collaborative action through uh, investor coalitions. And for banks, I would say uh, a lot of the uh, same issues and motivations uh, hold true, uh, but there are uh, some nuances that, that are a bit, um, I would say, a bit different. But by and large, uh, whether it's banks or investors, they're primarily uh, focused on two aspects. One is risk management, and the other is uh, looking for investment or financial opportunities. Um, next slide, please. 
So from a risk management perspective, uh, banks are essentially um, concerned with the credit worthiness of, of their clients. So it's loan repayment over the tenor of, uh, of the loan. Um, and credit worthiness uh, features that there's a business disruption for any, uh, any issues. The second is this whole idea of reputational risk management brought on by a new regulation or uh, litigation. Uh, so, for example, I think it was Philip uh, who mentioned um, that uh, a lot of the companies in this uh, supply chain uh, change research uh, didn't include corporate commitments to not sourcing from uh, protected areas or World Heritage sites. And for banks, interestingly enough, a lot of their, uh, well, increasingly, a lot of policies refer to not financing clients who source from uh, protected uh, areas, uh, high conservation value uh, regions or world heritage sites. So this is definitely something that is on their radar. Uh, they openly disclose it, but it's definitely a conversation that they have one-on-one -on -one with their clients rather than, uh, I would say, through the collaborative action that you see with uh, investor coalitions and networks. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we also see this area of transition risk uh, coming up. I mean, this is something that is definitely relevant in the climate uh, change domain, but we're seeing it more and more in other uh, interrelated environmental areas such as uh, biodiversity and deforestation risk. So this is really about the cost of doing business increasing when moving to uh, a greener economy. And I think the fourth, and it's sort of related to that a bit, and I didn't mention it, is the biophysical risks. So what are the unplanned costs due to climate and other environmental disruptions? And this is really critical from a business continuity perspective. And banks are definitely, um, I mean, that's something that is definitely on their radar uh, when, when they engage with their clients, whether it's during the onboarding process for issuing a loan or uh, during a uh, annual client review. Um, and I wanted to mention as well this, uh, you know, how, uh, how sort of risk management also features not only with the big uh, international commercial banks that are um, uh, looking at this issue, but by and large how it's kind of uh, being uh, channeled to the domestic banks that are uh, primarily issuing these loans to palm oil plantations and uh, palm oil processors in Indonesia, and that is through the sub-borrower uh, relationship. Uh, and I would say increasingly a lot of the international banks are having those conversations with the, uh, with the sub borrowers based in either Indonesia or Singapore. So it's definitely a, uh, a point of leverage. Um, next slide, please. And uh, aside from risk management, I would say increasingly banks are also looking at uh, investment opportunities, uh, business opportunities related to uh, managing and mitigating deforestation risk. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, really like the crux of the Good Growth Partnership is focused on capital reallocation to sustainable production models. Uh, and that takes various forms. One is financing clients with a track record on corporate commitments to sustainable sourcing. So this is where um, the uh, data derived from supply change is really, really critical. And the second is investing in target landscapes, innovations and commodities for impact. And we see this through a number of interventions such as support to smallholders um, and increasingly as well through technical assistance to test jurisdictional approaches. 
approaches. So whether it's restoration finance or uh, looking at uh, models for uh, intensification and uh, agriculture and new agriculture business practices. So I'm going to end there. So we'll, we'll go into the Q&A. We, I, I would just say to everybody who's on the line, I know you've uh, been raising hands. We have a number of questions coming in. So I would suggest actually, I know you have your hand raised, but if you could please write in your question to the to the questions box, um, that will help us queue them up uh, and, and you know make sure they're answered. Otherwise, if we do run out of time, um, then we'll, we'll follow up and, and make sure everybody gets a response. Um, the, the couple of just quick questions, I have uh, a few here, one for each. Uh, Philip, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Um, but Owen, in respect to the scorecard, uh, you know, one of the things that we've done over the years is track uh, the, the scorecards and scores and rankings that companies receive from organizations like WWF. Uh, just looking at this kind of recent scorecard, what is the um, the overlap or the kind of the the intersection and and uh, I guess crossover between the two uh, scopes of works of supply change, what we track and and uh, the scorecard? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So there is a good amount of overlap between the two um, because we both are looking at more downstream companies. You guys are also looking at producers, but this scorecard is mostly exclusively looking at downstream companies. So in this version of the scorecard and your version of the report, there are about 40 companies in common, uh, mostly in the downstream sector. So big companies like Nestle or McDonald's, other retailers. Um, so people can go to palmoilscorecard.panda.org to view the four resorts, results and uh, search individual companies and also download our analysis. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for the uh, succinct response also. That's, that's great. Um, I'll just move down the line to Julie. Uh, a question at the, the top here about um, maybe a really specific example that you might be able to provide uh, based on you know how investors can use uh, the data or have used the data, I think just to maybe illuminate it if you can provide um, you know a, an example, that'd be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that um, an example that I bring up is um, the work that we actually collaboratively did on traceability. Um, so, it, you know, although traceability um, does vary based on the supply chain, um, if you look at um, palm oil and palm oil commitments, what an investor will do in terms of engaging with the company is they will compare um, the traceability commitments or traceability status of their supply chain, of the individual company's supply chain, to competitors. And so they'll use data um, that either we have collected or um, that comes from um, additional sources to be able to compare that traceability. And so I can say that from companies that um, our investors have worked with, um, probably within the last year, we've had four to five um, commitments that have come out of the engagements, specifically to be able to clarify um, the level of traceability within their supply chain, or to be able to um, commit to um, partnerships or other ways to be able to improve the transparency of the supply chain. So I hope that that helps. Thanks, Julie. Um, great. And then uh, to you, Laura, I have a question here that is about um, understanding the um, sort of like the, the, the data as either do we have enough or, or not enough? Uh, is there enough to really uh, change decision making uh, from, from FIs? I mean, in terms of adopting the data into the decision making practice? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if it's uh, necessarily related to enough of uh, the data so much as an issue of consistent data and uh, granular enough data that can be translated to financial decision making. So I think, um, for example, a lot of what we have is either 
uh, you know, location specific um, or, or sort of site specific or, or asset level specific, but does it necessarily translate to something that is uh, giving the uh, investor or financier uh, enough of an insight into what is happening uh, at the uh, enterprise-wide level for that uh, view on risk assessment. So I'm not really sure if it's a question of enough so much as a uh, translation of the data for it to become fit for purpose for what uh, investors and financiers really need. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, now, we, we do have a number of hands, and actually more hands are being raised, uh, but, but it looks like people aren't putting those, those questions in the chat box. Let's try to open up uh, some, of the, um, some of the lines here and, and just maybe just do one at one-to-one. -one. So uh, I see the first name that, that we saw that raised a hand was uh, David Bendel. Can we unmute David's line and you can ask his question? David, if you're able to come through, let us know. Otherwise, let's move on just in the interest of time. There are two further up that I see. Um, Seha, Lesniuska. I'll go to Seha. Um, hello. Um, hello, yeah. My name's Fia Lesniuska. I, I actually did put a question in. Um, <laughs> I, I was just wondering, Overall, the um, the report seems to show a direction of travel which is going in the right direction. Um, but you do emphasise that the rise in the market uh, in Asia by 2030 would be over 60 percent, and the middle class consumption is is growing. And I just wonder, you know, where you see things developing there. For invest in investment, what, what, what the picture is going to be like there? And a, a final question, really, about the current situation um, with COVID-19. Will the post-COVID-19 world uh, still have the same appetite for sustainable investment? Those questions. Who, anybody on the panel want to take that first? Yeah, hi, this is Owen. Uh, I, can, I can address the uh, first part of your question there. So um, there's a lot of work going on right now in Asia, specifically with WS Singapore, um, who is engaging Asian banks and investors on their lending policies. Um, as you can imagine, the progress is sometimes quite difficult because it starts at the sort of base level of awareness about ESG and environmental issues. Um, and you kind of have to establish that before getting to a palm oil specific policy. Um, and the other risk there is also you don't necessarily want to jump straight to a palm oil policy because, you know, we don't want banks and investors thinking about only that. We wanted them to be thinking about other climate issues and other commodities and things like that. So I would say, uh, yeah, the progress there is starting um, and I'm hopeful about its progress. Thank you. Stephen, if I can jump in. Go ahead, Go ahead Paul. Um, one, one note to, to mention is that I think increasingly we, we're seeing that the scope of company commitments are growing um, such that there's, uh, like for example, recently PepsiCo just expanded the scope of their commitment to include all of their own supply or their all of their you know, suppliers um, to be compliant, but then also to make sure that any supply that they are sending or selling to other companies need to be in compliance. Now, actually making sure that there, those, uh, that all of that information is addressed or that all of that performance is uh, done will be a challenge, but I think there could be demand from Europe and North America, which could definitely, uh, did definitely uh, influence those those other markets. This is Julie. I'd be happy to um, address the last part of the question on COVID nineteen. 
Um, so um, what we are um, seeing, at least within the food and forest space, is an increasing recognition of how these, um, what is considered external risks or shocks can um, impact the um, economic, it can impact the overall economy. So this idea that um, these shocks can really have an impact in um, the overall um, worth of your investment. And so um, we are actually seeing that we are having um, additional investors actually come to be able to um, talk to us um, about climate change and about um, the impacts um, in terms of, we look at this in terms of natural climate solutions or other aspects. So um, we see it as a recognition um, of things that are in the, that are going on within the, the market. Mrs. Lara, I'd like to deal with the second uh, part of the question as well, if possible. I know we're- Please do, oh, Lara. That would be... yeah, no, no, yeah. go ahead. That will be the final, the final answer. So go oh, ahead. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think similar to Julie, we've actually had, uh, a, I sort of anticipated a diminishing of uh, interest from our stakeholders uh, under the GGP, but it's actually been the opposite uh, in that we work very closely, for example, with the Central Bank of Paraguay, with a number of banking associations in uh, Brazil, and they've actually come to us and said, uh, no, we're really uh, keen to have, um, you know, insight and capacity building into uh, these sort of extra financial issues that are going to impact uh, the sort of renewed uh, economic development post COVID-19. So for a country like Paraguay that is heavily um, resource dependent and particularly commodity dependent on soy and beef exports, uh, this whole idea of how do you do that within uh, the sort of current environmental constraints is, uh, is going to be top of mind for them, particularly as they've signed, um, you know, trade agreements with uh, with the European Union. So I don't think these issues are going away. I think they'll be more top of mind in the context of um, uh, economic development post COVID nineteen. That's insightful, and really appreciate that um, extra. Kind of context, and you know, I think we we do have a number of other questions that have come through in the interest of time, and also in respect for our speakers' time, and and everybody else in the line. What we'll do is uh, we'll collate these questions and uh, work with each of the speakers to get answers together. So when we do our follow up, we'll provide uh, those answers in a brief Q and A. Um, but this has been really interesting, really great. I mean, this is really just kind of kicking off the conversation. So please do go to our website to download the report, supply-change.org. It's right on the home page at the top. Uh, there's a banner icon uh, that you'll be able to see there. And if you do want to get in touch with any of the speakers, let us know. Uh, send us an email to info at supply-change.org and, and we'll do our best to put you in touch. Um, and but, but I guess to close out the webinar, just to thank you all as, as uh, attendees for joining. Thank you to our speakers very much for the time. Thank you to UNFFI, a collaborator on this, on this project in particular, uh, and everybody else that works with us and supports us uh, in doing the work that we do. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and uh, be well, be healthy, and be safe. Thank you.